Okay, let's get started. And for those of you who are not here, welcome. Uh, the stuff that we talked about before with character design is going to still be applicable. So we have, uh, I, I wanted to bring these slides up again just as a refresher. So you need to be thinking in terms of making appealing contrasts and think, making contrasts not only to uh, the relationship of things that are in the piece, but also relationship to known things outside of the pieces. Um, and, and especially if you're doing a historical environment or even a futuristic environment, there's a lot of things that are going to be happening um, behind the scenes that people will be comparing your thing with naturally. You know, people will, will without you even meaning to, make comparisons between the, the buildings that you're drawing or the mountains that you use or the trees or whatever. And so the point of the design is to control what's happening, to make it so that people, when they look at your piece, you know exactly how they're going to react, what they are comparing it to, and so forth. Okay? Um, the novelty familiarity ratio is going to be an important one still. It, it applies in a very different way now. So you, will, you are doing, most likely most of you, are going to be doing pretty familiar things. You know, you're going to be doing castles, or you're going to be doing cities, or you're going to be doing cottages, and um, you know that because there is so much there that is familiar already, and there may be exceptions like with Ryan, where you're, you may be doing alien landscapes, and then you have to, or um, Andrew, and in that case, you have to be worrying about it from the other angle. But for a lot of you, you've got this thing that's already super familiar. And you need to be thinking in terms of what new am I bringing to the table? Why am I painting a castle? Why am I spending all this time painting a castle? You need to think of something to justify that that makes it so that everybody says, I'm really glad you painted that castle. I never thought of a castle in that way before. You're bringing something novel to what is otherwise familiar. Okay? I should have had that centered on the frame the whole time. So story is going to apply in a very similar way. We'll talk in a little bit about how story applies. Um, and style, we, I just answered a question about that, and I, I guess I'll reiterate it for the recording, that it's okay for your character style and for your environment style to be a little bit different, but they shouldn't be clear uh, you know, on opposite ends of the spectrum from each other. They should feel like they go together. Uh, that, if you're doing a fish... Uh, even if you're doing a fish out of water story, they should it should feel like your character uh, could live in that environment, and it would be okay. That viewers would be okay with that. Okay. All right. So we haven't really talked about this much yet. We may have in the very first lecture, but um, when you're dealing with an environment, when you're designing an environment, there are usually, I think you're going to find you're having just all this incredibly complex stuff that's all competing with each other for attention, and you're going to be managing a lot of complexity, right? With character, you can really control it, and you can, you know, uh, have a, a high degree of influence on what people see when they see it and what they feel about it, right? In an environment, it becomes a lot more difficult because, you know, every tree, every rock, every everything could become something that competes for attention. So uh, one of the ways that people will often forget and not think about is using line and flow to unify things. So this is a gestalt principle that um, when you have objects that are even somewhat aligned to each other, that our brain automatically starts to categorize them as, they, as though they are part of one greater whole. So if you have a tree, and at the bottom of that tree you have a rock, and instead of going this way, the rock goes this way, your brain pulls those two things together. And then if the needles and the branches kind of flow down or two, then that entire sweep, even though it's two different, completely separate lines, it still communicates the idea that 
you know, they're part of this cohesive thing. And you can kind of see that here, how even though there are separate flows going through this, it feels like that whole pattern and alignment of objects are part of the same thing. So here's an example from Todd Harris that is, um, is really interesting. This is kind of a lower resolution version of it, but you can see how much is going on here. Just character after character, just all crammed into this tiny space. These are supposed to be characters that are petrified. And there's alignments that are happening both on the exterior and then alignments that are happening within. So we actually have this like, and this brush is getting distracting, but we have these alignments within, these lines that kind of cross that, that serve to actually unify it in that opposite direction, um, even though they're, they're opposing each other. So like with this wing kind of pulling down into that section, and then that spear point that's being pulled down into that, right? So you don't necessarily need to do this with everything, but it's a great way to manage something that is very complex like this. You'll also notice how much of this there is happening at a smaller level that even from going out here to the arm, into the helmet, into the shoulders and the arm, down through the body, there's just this like great flow of line and movement. And you may not necessarily be able to control which direction people's eye move, but our eye is going to have a tendency to move along and flow through. It's a, a way to help control composition as well. Any questions about that? So this clearly doesn't have a focal point, um, but your eye like travels through really nicely. So is that the idea for our environment? So do you want to, or if you want a focal point, do you do that? I think... So this, this is a path composition, which we talked about. And um, in a path composition, there's usually a place that is highest in the hierarchy. And I would say that that's this right here. That's the place where there's the most co pattern contrast in the image, even though value contrast is about the same throughout. And so that's why I think this. So no matter what you do with your image, no matter how you decide to manage that complexity, you will probably want to have a hierarchical high point, a place where the contrast is highest. So, so. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a spotlight composition. We talked about this uh, last time or the time before, but I'm just going to review it again because this is going to be really important in your environments, almost more so than your character, because this is another way to control whether an area is interesting, how your eye flows through it, and so forth, right? So, as you can see, our eye just naturally takes all of those shapes and groups them together into a single line. In fact, if, that, if this up-down pattern goes on for long enough, your brain will actually translate it into this. Whoa, not that. Just a straight line. It'll actually start to ignore the undulations in it. And so that's not necessarily bad. Sometimes, you know, that's a, a useful thing to, to be able to take a very complicated thing and unify it into a single shape using a pattern. But generally speaking, and I think because as artists we have a tendency to do this first, that it's good to teach yourself to do this. So break up the proportions, break up the distances, um, break up the sizes so that you have, a f you know, you'll notice that that last slide and this one are related. So you've got this flow and movement that's going through these squares, but now that is being paired and, and contrasted with this kind of break up of the sizes and proportions and even how quickly it turns those angles you know this is very even doing kind of the same thing up and down this one goes up a little bit then down and up really high really fast and then eases out of that right and those are the types of things you want to look at when you're controlling rhythm this is a really th hard thing to do this is a very advanced design principle so if you can force yourself uh, and you will you'll have to force yourself at first but if you can force yourself 
to learn it and get it down so that it's just in your hands and it's the thing that comes out naturally, then you're going to be a much, much better designer. And even if you're not going to end up being a concept artist, this is a really useful principle to know. If you're a lighter, you know, how far apart do you put those little spots of light to lead the eye through the composition? And, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, when you're populating a world, how far apart do you space things and, and so forth, right? So this is going to apply to the speed of the curve and also the line thickness, as we talked about. And there's lots of different ways that a line's rhythm can be done. I posted these up online. These are from Ronnie Del Carmen. This is from Craig Elliott. It's actually from the style guide of uh, Enchanted. And he actually has a couple pieces that talk about how their Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau style was used. So I definitely recommend looking that up. I think this stuff was posted on the Art Center blog a while ago. So if you want to get the full set that Ronnie Del Carmen posted, it's there. Okay, so there are multiple uh, components to the story of an environment, and the first one is character. And I've just heard this so many times that you should treat your environment like a character. But interestingly, I've, I've also heard lots of people say, um, environment designers, say that your environment plays a supporting role. It's like the soundtrack, and it shouldn't draw too much attention to itself. And so I think that both things are true, but they're both true at different times. So I'm going to show you examples here of things that have character in them, but aren't drawing too much attention to themselves, but also things that are deliberately made to draw attention to themselves because they are a character in the film. They're as important as a character would be, right? A film or a game. And so it sometimes helps when you're designing something to start out with the mindset of what, you know, if this castle was a character, what kind of character would it be? You know, what personality am I just trying to describe here? If I'm drawing this tree, what kind of character is this? I want, and I did this one. I wanted this character to be a monster, and what I wanted it especially to be was a sick monster. I wanted it to be a monster that was dying, basically, and was in its throes and was struggling for life still, right? And so all of the, the tension down here pulling away, all the tension through here, all of that was supposed to give it this kind of sickly, struggling type of look, right? And then, of course, there's even some personification elements with the mouth and the multiple eyes here. But um, that can come across in lots of different ways. You know, this is... Ah, oh, shoot, now my mind just slipped the artist that did this. I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, so this castle, even though all the lines in it are straight and, you know, this thing's straightforward, it comes across as being, to me anyways, kind of a scared vampire. You know, it's got its cape pulled up and it's like, you know, kind of pulling away from all of, you'll notice all the, the windows and everything are all spaced clear up here and there's just this big long wall. There's only this tiny bridge and this, you know, big divide and, uh, you know, I like how it, it manages to be looming, which is why I would say it's a scared vampire and not just a scared person. It, it's definitely, you know, trying to be, uh, you know, this dominant feature, this kind of fortress of sorts. But deep down, there's this insecurity about its position in the world that I think is really, it plays up in the way that the proportions are being used here. This is one of Dussault's. Uh, concepts, or I, I don't actually remember if this is a concept or if it's um, a map painting, but this is Rivendell from the Lord of the Rings movies. And, you know, in this case, it ends up being more realistic, but there's a character to this too, right? Like the whole environment, it, it tells this story of this kind of uneasy haven, right? You know, it's like you, you want to go there, you feel like this is a nice place to go, but it's not the place that you'd want to live. It's a, it's a rest in the middle of a very dangerous journey, and that's the only time you would spend there, right? 
Um, once you actually get inside it, they change the colors and change the shapes a little bit and, and make it just a little bit more comfortable. But it, there's always just that little bit of tension. The place is never super comfortable. And we could, we could probably break these down for a long time and we have to get through the whole lecture. So we'll just do a little bit at a time. So, um, so there's something called the figure ground relationship. If you're doing a composition and you've got a big empty space in that thing and you put a vertical feature in that, that becomes a character, right? So, or I mean it becomes a figure against a ground, right? So these are, this is a, a gestalt principle again. If I do a ground here and I pull a feature out of it, then which is the ground and which is the figure? It's those vertical things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be vertical. You can actually uh, break something a different direction and have it come across in the same way. But the idea is that you're using the field around it to pull the character out, and that's uh, one way that you can, you can make a, a character in this uh, field you know, you've got this basically more normal, and, and in this case, you know, the environment is not normal. It's pretty extreme, but this thing is so much more extreme than everything around it that it becomes a character in the midst of this environment, right? So here's some other examples of anthropomorphization. You get the feeling that these are these kind of huddling creatures here. I think this is Jake Parker. Uh, this is Hildebrandt, I think. I can't tell. Anyway, there's some extremely obvious uh, anthropo... Uh, it's the hardest word to say, so I'm not going to say it again. Anyway, that's a great tool that you can use. Um, style is... Uh, so I, I said style here, but I would say using flow and rhythm would be ways that you can add the type of energy in life to an environment, make it feel alive. And if you do a lot of that within single elements in the environment, then they become, they, they take on character to them, especially when those relationships start to mean something like they do here, right? So... Um, some great examples of just the, the pushing and pulling to make that feature become a character in and of itself. And even something fairly plain like this can become a character when, um, you know, those purport when you're careful with those proportions and you, you tell the story that you want to tell with it. I, I think it, an important part of this character is these trees that are placed on either side. You've got this very drab city and not only do we have the spot of color here, but we have this little picket fence and the trees there, and that helps kind of tell the, the tell us what this character is and what the character is about, right? It's this one comfortable spot in an otherwise harsh world. That's Rob Rappel. And this is Bruce Zick. I figure if I'm going to be posting this up online, I need to tell you who the artists are. I don't remember who did that, but he's awesome. And I think... Uh, that's Paula saying, I believe. Okay, so history becomes something that, you know, you may have gotten away without having any type of history to your character. You can't really get away with it without, in an environment. You need history or the, char the environment starts feeling very contrived, right? So you're using either ruin, overgrowth, or buildup to communicate the idea of history. Those are your tools for history. And so here are some examples. So with growth um, or overgrowth, you get some different stages in the history through that. There's early or cultivated growth. So we have this tree, for example, which is you know, fairly young tree, it's very cultivated, you know, it's, they're taking care of it. But then we have this later unchecked growth on this 
tree in the background. I mean, on this, ha this house in the background. And, uh, you know, you know that this is an older building that is not necessarily being super well taken care of because of that, right? And then you have uh, overgrowth uh, that happens when some, you know, when one thing dies and then something else grows over it, right? So you've got these old trees that now are becoming these, the ground for this new growth. Um, this is also Polysane. And uh, so that, these are all things that you can, you can layer them and weave them together. Um, you don't need to necessarily have them everywhere, but I would make sure that you have some of them in your piece. Or it, like I said, it'll feel contrived or uh, false. OK, so ruin. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that something is totally destroyed. It's just that something has, it's wear, being worn down. It could be something like this where it's ruins. It's a, you know, landmark of a past society. Or it could be just, you know, this is a place that people are still using. The torches are still burning. They still are keeping barrels in the basement. But you definitely get a feeling that this place has age because of that. Uh, the parts of the wall that are broken down. The steps being worn down from being stepped on and so forth, the stains coming down from the water and stuff. Although stains are technically part of the build-up part, which is what we're going to talk about next. So um, build-up, and I should talk. I, I don't remember the artist that did that one or that one either, unfortunately. Um, that one is, I can't even say his name. I'll, I'll send out a link to him. Uh, he's a Chinese artist, I think. Worked on a bunch of films. He's really good. Okay, this is, uh, I be believe this is Craig Elliott again. And so build-up is something that can be organic or inorganic. So, um, yeah, like the water stains are technically going to be a, a type of build-up when you get sediment that blows into an area and, you know, it's kind of like being, you know, covering part of a structure or something like that. That's a type of buildup. And then living things, you know, like people, we have a tendency to just use and reuse and reuse and modify and, and so forth. And so you get a sense of history just by the type of buildup. So here's a great image by Todd Harris again. And you get a sense of these multiple layers. You have this ancient fortress down here that was built a long time ago, you know, with these bridges and everything. And then on top of that is this kind of uh, renaissance or, you know, maybe late medieval town that's, you know, got the kind of the wood struts and I'm not even sure what those are called, but, you know, it's got this definite feel to it. And then you've got these kind of Byzantine or even more enlightened uh, type of...